Dio is out of ideas. As he sits in the hospital waiting area trying to write up a reaction for the protagonist of his story com, he realizes that his mind is coming up empty. He closes his eyes, leaning back on the stiff vinyl chair and scours his brain. Moments go by and just as he is on the brink of a light bulb idea, the nurse interrupts his musings. She asks him to get some medicines from the pharmacy. Dio's mother is very sick. She was admitted to ICU three days ago due to her heart condition. It's so bad that she needs a ventilator this time. The doctors have told him to be prepared for the fact that she might not make it to the new year. She's very old now and she has many health conditions but Dio would fight for her life as long as she has the fight still inside her. He gets back to his seat in the waiting area, opening his laptop, he starts raking his mind. A sharp screeching makes him look up from his laptop screen. A strange slip of a girl is pushing a row of vinyl chairs from across the room to where he is sitting. She pushes the set of chairs up against the wall and sits next to him. Dio watches in detached amazement as she pulls a pack of sliced fruits from her backpack and starts snacking on them. He tries to divert his attention back to work. The idea didn't come to him but disaster did. The call from his manager. Dio steps out to take the call explaining to him that he's been cooped up in the hospital. He doesn't normally write scripts for love stories, but Tui had faith in him and Dio didn't want to disappoint. He promises that he'd be sending the script his way soon. Dio looks around him as he puts the phone down. Sick children clinging to their moms. Old people in wheelchairs. People hooked to IVs. How can someone write a romantic comedy in such depressing atmosphere? When he walks back to the ICU waiting area, the strange girl is reciting some mantras from a book. So she must be religious. In his time in and out of the hospital, he's seen people praying for their loved ones. He isn't sure if those prayers actually work. He really needs to get back to writing. Ka makes a precise decision then. This is getting ridiculous. He is chanting the mantra along with her in his mind now. He needs to focus. Dio takes a long drink of water and is attacked by a sudden onset of hiccups. This is the most unfortunate time for hiccups. Something bursts loudly next to his ear. Startled, Dio opens his eyes. It's the girl again, holding a limp plastic bag. They sit in the cafeteria, and the girl, Bu is her name, tells Dio that the plastic bag hack is something she came up with to aid with hiccups. It always works for her piano student. As they get into small talk, Dio tells her about his writer's block with the script that he's been writing. Pua insists on reading it. The script is a story about five couples with overlapping stories of life events. Pua is too impatient to read it till the end. Dio explains that the fun in reading is when you go through the character buildup as the story progresses, not jumping to conclusions. Someone on the opposite side. Jingjing is being forced into quarantine, ever since her friend has been taken by the authorities for testing positive for COVID-19. She's been locked up in her house for the past week. The doctor is going to run the tests again in a couple of days, if it's negative this time, she'll be free to dissolve quarantine. Jingjing puts the phone down after explaining this to her father. Kam is having a bad week too. The Japanese programmers weren't able to fly in, and his company can't do anything about it. So the next two weeks were off for him. He didn't know what to do with that much time on hand. He's been busy gambling with his friend Golf, but he was running dry now after losing wager after wager to Kam. As a last-ditch effort, Golf wagers that Kam won't be able to sit at home. For the next few days Kam makes himself busy with all the possible chores around the house. He even tries taking apart his computer and then putting it back together. One day an idea strikes him. He calls Golf telling him that he's going to lose this bet, as well because he's just come up with a new idea to keep himself busy. Food delivery via a drone. Drone food delivery. For the first time in all of Thailand. The drone's maiden voyage experiences turbulence as it jams right before Jingjing's balcony where she is busy hanging a load of laundry. Startled by the sudden movement, Jingjing hits the drone. Kam rushes to his own balcony to stop her, but his attempt is futile. The drone whizzes to and fro and then drops to the ground in a sickening crunch. Kam winces in pain. Later that evening, Kam relays the day's events to golf, telling how the girl refused to take responsibility for her mistake. She isn't ready to pay a dime for the drone's repairs, claiming that it wasn't her fault. The drone could have been from a pervert for all she knew. She acted in self-defense. Golf finds the girl cute. He suggests taking their bet a step further. He wagers 20 grand if Kam could woo the girl and start dating in the next 14 days. Kam isn't too keen on the idea, but he's never one to shy away from a bet. Jingjing is busy relaying her side of the story to her friend in the hospital over a phone call when Kam's drone startles her once again. It's carrying another delivery, but this time it's for her. As Jingjing pulls a cracker out of the delivered package, there's also a note in it asking Jingjing to add Kam online. Dio asks Biu if she would have added Kam online if she had been in Jingjing's place. Biu would have. Firstly, because she'd have liked to know what Kam had up his sleeve. Second, she could always have blocked him if they didn't get along. And third, this would have helped her move on from her ex T, who had been two-timing her the whole time they were dating. Dio disagrees, moving on isn't as simple as that. Biu tells her that it was for her sister, who got married to someone she met on Tinder. Although they are now divorced. If it's the right person, it'll work out in any way. If it's not, it'll end with them going their separate ways. So Jingjing adds Kam online. He texts an apology about losing control of his drone. 
The conversation flows quite freely after that as they discuss how boring isolation at home is. They also talk about potential movies to watch and chores to do to keep the wheel spinning. When Golf visits Kam a few days later, he couldn't believe that Kam's been chatting with the girl for the past three days. In the next 14 days, Golf better prepare for those two crates of beer and 20 grand. Over the course of days, as Kam and Jingjing Jing grow closer, they are practically glued to their phone 24-7. Kam introduces her to his favorite RPG game which they end up playing together all day long. They take socially distanced walks in the life-size hamster balls that Kam bought for them. They even had a rooftop date night, complete with candlelight, cutlery, and a three-course meal, all while maintaining their distance. Jingjing Jing was falling in love. Kam is not enjoying it anymore. He is beginning to get a strong feeling that things are getting more and more serious with Jingjing. Jing. He confides this to Golf, saying that he doesn't want to continue with the bet any longer. Golf is having none of it. He never knew Kam to back down from a wager. Kam is in no mood to joke around. He does not know for sure how Jingjing Jing feels about him but he feels guilty for lying to her. He doesn't even want to imagine how upsetting it would be for her if she finds the truth out. Not to mention the fact that his girlfriend is coming back soon. Golf is intrigued, Kam is falling for the girl. Kam transfers 20 grand to Golf's account as he reneges the wager. He wants out of this one. After Golf leaves him to his misery, Kam receives a text from his girlfriend, telling him that she'll be coming to see him, after she drops some dinner and catches up with an old friend. In a spur of the moment, Kam decides to go see Jingjing Jing at her apartment, as he knocks on her door, Jingjing Jing opens surprised to see him there. She invites him in. Kam divulges the truth to her then. He apologizes for lying to her, as this whole time, he'd been acting in accordance with the bed he made with a friend. He had grown to like her very much, though, and didn't want their companionship to end. He tells her that they could be friends and that his girlfriend will be visiting him soon. Hearing the commotion, Jingjing's Jing's friend steps out of the bathroom. She'd stopped by to drop some dinner at her place. Kam's world whirls 360 degrees as he recognizes the face. This was his girlfriend. Bua smacks her lips in dismay, she couldn't understand why Dio would finish the story on that note. Dio doesn't like happy endings. Nobody knows how their life will end. You don't always get a happy ending. The next day, as Dio stands on the hospital driveway promising his manager that the script is coming along nicely, Bu pats his shoulder. She wants to read more of what he has written. Someone next door, Bangkok Pitayamantri School Student of the Year 2021, Chan. This girl is known as the Ice Queen. Seeing her face on the board outside their school really annoys Tiradet. As he enters the premises, they come from two different worlds. A group of boys playing soccer asked her to pass them the ball that has just landed at his feet. Tur's shot bounces off the wall hitting an incoming bike rider, making him tumble off the bike and into the fences. As Tur stands, getting reprimanded for his nonchalant kick, Principal Napaporn tells him that his misdemeanor has cost him a deduction of 50 points from his behavior score. After Mr. Samchai leaves the office, Napaporn Tur's mom smacks him with her stick. It was difficult enough to work at the place where her child studies, let alone a child who insists on being an embarrassment day after day. Back home in his room, Tur is lighting up a cigarette when his gaze is drawn to a sudden movement in the opposite window. It is Chan taking her shirt off. For a moment Tur stands frozen, then clears his throat to alarm her. Chan turns around and yanks the curtains closed, disgruntled. It wasn't Tur's fault, why is she always acting in such a sour manner? The next day Tur relays what had happened at his window last evening to his friend. Living next door to the Ice Queen is a lucky turn of events for everyone at school except Tur himself. For him, it was more pain and no pleasure. His mother is constantly sending him over to help with chores such as changing the light bulb, fixing the fence, bringing them fruits, etc. It's constant torture. Napaporn is furious looking down at Tur's report book. How could he fail six subjects at school? Tur points that he flunked four subjects last year, so having six this year is really cool. Exasperated, Napaporn tells him to get some inspiration from the girl next door. She's been an honorary student her entire life. Oh how Tur wishes that Chan wasn't living next door, or anywhere near him, as matter of fact. His wish is granted a few days later as she moves abroad to pursue her studies in China. Tur is flummoxed though. When Chan was around, it had been his most ardent wish for her to be as far away as possible. Now that she has gone, something doesn't feel right to him. One evening, Tur is in his lawn, watering the plants there when Mr. Samchai stops by. He hands him a piece of paper with a WeChat ID written on it. Tur asks him whose ID it is. Samchai tells him to just log in, and he'll see for himself. That night when he logs in, it turns out to be the Ice Queen, Chan herself. Unbelievable as it was, Tur asks him why she is making contact with him. Chan needs help. She tells him that, while she's been away for the past three months, her grandma has been very lonely. Her father spends very little time at home which leaves her grandma to her own devices pretty much all day, every day. She wants her to drop by with one nice excuse or another, once a day. She sends him a list of her grandma's favorites along with some cash to buy them. Chayan's grandma suffers from Alzheimer's, and Tur has to remind her who he is every single time he goes over to visit. 
She warms up to him quickly, and they spend days watching scary movies, eating her favorite foods, and going for doctor's appointments. Days go by until it's time for Chayan to visit for summer break. One call one night, Chayan thanks him gratefully for all that he's been doing for her grandma. She asks Tur what he wants her to bring him when she visits in two weeks' time. Tur doesn't really want anything. He's only surprised to come to know this side of Chayan. The Ice Queen doesn't possess an icy heart after all. Her smile melts Tur's heart. Chayan never gets to leave China. The government imposes a lockdown to contain the outbreak. Tur sits dejected that morning, nibbling his breakfast. He asks his mom what made her fall in love with his dad. Napaporn had hated Tur's father when they first met, but his kindness and sweet gesture won her over not soon after. She tells Tur that love isn't anything over the top that they show in movies. It's the little things in life that you do for someone you love that makes love. She then asks Tur instead if he has made any girl hate her yet. That night when Tur gets Chayan's call, he asks her how she's been. Chayan's been confined to her room with survival provisions. The embassy has informed her that if they were lucky, they might have a flight back home for next week. But she has little hope for it. She has never missed home the way that she misses it now. She asks her to take even better care of her grandma. In a surge of inexplicable emotion, Tur tells her that he won't do it. She is her grandma, and Chayan better get back here soon to look after her. For some reason, Chayan smiles at that rude outburst. It was so strange. They had lived next door to each other all their lives but had never talked as much as they do now. It wasn't strange, Tur answers as he glances over to Chayan's sketch he's made a couple weeks ago. The two of them have always lived in two different worlds. The app hangs up once again. Chayan puts her face between her hands. She wants to ask him to take her into his world. She's always been fascinated by him. His innocent, carefree, kindred self had forever been a source of interest for Chayan's camera. Bua slams the laptop in frustration. She whirls over to Dio, asking why he always writes the ending like it's unfinished. Did Chayan make it home? Does Tur ever find out that Chayan is into him? Will they get together? She wants to know what happens after this. He always writes crappy endings. Dio doesn't find it crappy. He finds open endings good for viewers' interpretations. Well, to Bua, this movie is going to flop. Dio asks her to stop reading if she cannot stop criticizing. But Pew is having none of it. She asks him for the next story, maybe she'll finally like that one. Someone you hate. Have you ever hated someone's guts without ever seeing their face? Odd glances over at the rival company's writer. It wasn't because the writer worked for Rocket Man, but because they had been everywhere that Odd goes. He had raced with them many times. Two losses, one win. Today they'll race again. As the traffic light turns green, Odd sprints past Rocket Man, leaving smoke in his wake. But he follows Odd closely behind. At an intersection, Odd loses sight of him, as he cranes his neck to look for Rocket Man. He runs the bike straight into a sedentary garbage truck. Rocket Man passes him by with a derisive wave. Odd returns home, tail between his legs, to find his little sister sitting by the front door busy with her drawing. She informs Odd that their dad won't care much for him getting back home in such a state. Odd asks her to keep it a secret then, and she splays her hand for Odd to entice her with a bribe. Odd huffs, handing her a blue bill, saying that she should be busy playing with dolls like ordinary girls. Well, she wasn't ordinary, Ing scoffs. She is going to build a rocket and travel through time and space someday. The two siblings stare silently at the abandoned taxi parked before their home. Ing asks Odd then, when will their dad come home? When they visit him in the hospital the next day, the little girl asks Odd whether their father has any dreams while he sleeps in here. Odd has no answer to that. Maybe he does have dreams. Ing presses her father's leg and wishes that he has only good dreams and to never forget to include Ing and Odd in them. Odd sits in the hospital lobby, medical bill in hand. 55 grand. He needed to make money. And fast. That night, Odd gets back to his old racing squad. The leader Pewd hasn't gotten any softer in all this time. He smugly presents his freshly refurbished race bike, telling Odd how impossible it is going to be for him to win against it this time around. A police siren rings in the air all of a sudden and all of the motorbikers disperse in hopes of ditching the cops. Unfortunately for Odd, the vehicle tails him as he tries to escape. Not very far from the racing spot, Odd's bike gives in. It is in that moment that the rocket man appears, like his personal guardian angel. The rider motions him to hop onto his back. Odd leaves his bike behind, and they sprint away with the cops hot on their heels. Once safe in an indistinguishable alley, Odd gets off of the rider's bike. He wasn't sure what to say. He didn't want to thank the mystery rider. He's always imagined what the person would look like behind that helmet he always had on. But this time, he takes it off. Odd is startled to find that the mystery writer is a girl. His shock is broken in by the girl reminding him to express his gratitude for saving him. As Odd thanks her sheepishly, the girl divulges that she only did it because she isn't done competing with him and didn't want him locked away in jail before that. Odd is mesmerized by her indignant flip of hair. He never expected his greatest nemesis to have this effect on him. She then offers him to get to some place to eat. They sit outside Isidays, slurping instant ramen. She had bought him his favorite flavor. When Odd asks her how she knows he likes it, the girl answers that she knows much more than that. They sit in silence for a moment, finishing up their cups, and she breaks the ice, telling Odd that he is going to die tomorrow. 
At first Odd is flabbergasted, he asks her if she was a fortune teller. The girl answers that though she isn't a fortune teller, she knows quite a bit about him since she's from the future. Odd laughs in her face. This night was turning more and more absurd by the minute. The girl wasn't joking though. She tells Odd that she's gone to great lengths to come find him in this hour. If he partakes in the race tomorrow, he is going to be squished like a cracker. With that, she gets back on her bike and rides off. Odd gets back home with his bike with the help of his friend Chut. As he lays in bed that night, his mind races through what the mystery girl has said to him. Who is she? Is she really from the future, or is it just a prank? Odd lines up for the race the next day, but the girl's warning keeps ringing in his head. He could go through with the race. Odd turns his bike around and rides to the hospital instead. As he waits for the elevator to his father's room, he is shocked to find the mystery girl there. She steps out of the elevator and hands him the box with the race prize money. Astonished, Odd asks her how she got it. The girl asks him to just keep the money and stop worrying so much over trivial things as he doesn't know the future like she does. Odd finally asks her to identify herself. The girl flips away her hair, revealing a rocket tattooed on her neck. It's Ng, his extraordinary sister. Bue is a little impressed. She didn't take him for the sci-fi type. Dio asks her if she thinks it is too over the top. Bue isn't sure. But if someone was to come from the future and tell her what was about to happen next, that would be nice. She glances towards the ICU and sighs. Good news or bad, it would be a relief to know instead of drowning in hope and fear day after day. The nurse announces the end of visitation hours for patients, and Dio and Bu get up to leave. As Bu packs up her stuff, Dio is reminded that he never got to ask her who she is visiting here. Bu tells him it's her boyfriend, some secret admirer. Sua must be gone. Or it's what his friend Tom thinks, at least, given that Sua's temperature reads 33 degrees on the thermostat. Unlike his name which means tiger, Sua is a complete wimp. But he is a man of determination when it comes to certain things. Like aligning the stacks just right at the convenience store he works at. Or finding ticks on his dog hoodlum. To memorize the loyal customers' names. Tom yawns, complaining about never getting a morning shift assigned to him. Sua smirks as he takes notes in the inventory. He tells Tom that night shifts are good for him since he'd be off drinking in some bar all night, which won't be good for him. Tom's always asking for trouble when he's drunk. Sua likes it, these night shifts. It's cooler, slower, and he gets to play with his dog. Tom calls his bluff. Those aren't the reasons Sua likes to work night shifts. It's Yaw. Yaw waltzes into the store just then. She greets Sua with her usual 100-watt smile which never fails to make Sua go nearly blind to the rest of the world. The only thing Sua is not determined about is telling his crush how he feels. Like every other day, she's there to get something for her dentist boss. Ironically enough, Sua's crush has a crush on her boss. Tom and Sua decide to check the said dentist out and gauge Sua's chances. The next night they get to the clinic before 8.30. That's the time when the dentist leaves. Ya closes up by 9 p.m. Sua's has done his homework on his crush. Tom finds Dr. Noom to be quite ugly looking. But hideous or not, he was a doctor. Compared to him, Sua was nothing, a lowly store clerk. He didn't stand a chance. As Tom and Sua stand there, calculating the odds, Ya spots them in the hallway. She asks them what they were doing here. Baffled and bemused, Tom points to Sua, saying that he has a toothache. In the orthodontic chair, Sua lies helpless as Dr. Noom informs him of a severe cavity that is in need of filling. He proceeds to clean the infection and makes an appointment for the filling. Sua fights tooth and nail as the doctor tries to give him anesthesia. Their wrestling results in Dr. Noom tumbling to the floor with the anesthesia syringe sticking in his head. Dio asks Bua how she found the script so far. Bua likes the fact that Sua is very single-minded. She suggests that maybe Dio can play with that a bit. The nurse cuts into their discussion, inquiring about Carwin's relative. The doctor wanted to speak to Bua. Bua leaves Dio with a promise to continue their discussion later. Dio wanted very much to do that. But he didn't see her for quite a few days after. Until one day he spots her again, singing along with some elderly folks in the hospital lobby. When she hadn't shown up, Dio figured that her boyfriend must have been released from charge. It wasn't the case. Bu tells him that she's been out and about, to every holy place that any of their friends had told her. She prayed for his health everywhere. When the doctor had called her in, they told her that her boyfriend didn't have much time left. Sua has a newfound ambition now. He's going to study to pursue a career in dentistry. Tom can mock him all he wants, but Sua owes it to himself to at least try. Ya stops by that night to tell Sua that Dr. Noom has figured it out. That it's Ya leaving the snacks for him in the fridge every night. He has invited Ya for dinner at his condo. Several days later, Ya walks in the store, soaked to the bone in rain. In jerky monotone, she tells Sua that Dr. Noom has a girlfriend and that she saw them together. She tells him that although being played was hurtful, it wasn't as hurtful as watching him throw away her snacks. Sua has heard enough. He storms out into the pouring rain all the way to Dr. Noom's clinic. The doctor is just getting to leave when Sua barges in. With no further thought, he throws him to the ground with blow after blow from his clenched fist. That's Sua's way to show Ya how he loved her. 
but Ya never came by again. She resigned and moved to Chiang Mai. Rumor has it that she has a child out of wedlock. Suer resigned soon after that. Nobody knows where he's gone. But Tom believes that he must be in pursuit of something somewhere. Chiang Mai, five years later. Ya sits in the seating area, awaiting her turn. She's brought her son for the dental examination. When the doctor calls out their name, Ya freezes in shock delight. It was Sua. All these years later. For Bu this was unbelievable. A doctor. Well, it was her after all, who had suggested that Dio should play with Sua's determination. So there it is. And Bu likes this ending the best. She was sure Dio could write a happy ending. Dio proclaims that he actually does not know how to write stuff like this. It's only because of Bua, he wants to say. The nurse interrupts again with news that the patient has woken up. Not Bua's patient though. It is Dio's mother and she wants to see him. When Dio gets back to the seating area with news that his mother will be off the ventilator by tomorrow, Bua is nowhere to be found. Underneath his laptop is a note by her, saying that she's so happy that his mom is recovering. Real lives do have happy endings after all. She promises to watch his movie at the cinema. Little did Dio know that the moment he went to see his mom was the exact moment when Bu was called in to say her final goodbye to her boyfriend. Dio's mom remained in the ICU for the next two weeks. Then she spent another two months in a regular ward. But Dio never saw Bu again. He never fails to remember her though. He wonders where she is, how she is. He wishes that her tears may have dried by now and hopes that she misses him too. Dio sits at the screening of his movie in the cinema. It turned out to be not so shabby after all. Bua is there to watch a movie too. Love distancing, she tells the stewardess. The current showing had already started, so they had a few seats for 8.30's show. As Bu accepts the 8.30 show, Dio steps out of the theater to take a call. Like serendipity, they are drawn to each other, both of them finding it hard to contain their ecstatic giggles. Dio asks Bu what she was doing there. She is there to watch his movie, like she promised. In that moment, Dio felt his happy ending. 